If you want to know what a book's about, it's usually a good idea to look at the first page and the last page, the beginning and the end of the work. Doesn't work if it's an Agatha Christie thriller, by the way. The action of the Divine Comedy begins on the evening of Maundy Thursday, 1300, in the middle of a dark and menacing wood where the right road was wholly lost and gone. It ends outside time, in the contemplation of God, a vision which, is, which it is beyond human imagination to recall or human language to record, a blinding flash of insight into the love that moves the sun and the other stars. The dark wood in which Dante finds himself is the outward expression of the intellectual, emotional and spiritual tangle inside him. It's a way of describing the gone wrongness of his life, the mess from which he could find no way out except by embarking on his inward journey, going down into the depths and finding the way out on the other side, the way out which leads him, in the end, to God. Dante does not undertake this journey on his own. The whole of his quest is supervised by Beatrice, the woman he had loved when she was alive and who always stood in his imagination for the love and grace of God. Beatrice will guide him herself for most of the last part of the journey, but for the first part she entrusts Dante to the guidance of the great Roman poet Virgil. Dante admired Virgil as a writer and as an embodiment of human reason and natural goodness. But Virgil died before the birth of Christ, a worshipper of the pagan gods of ancient Rome, and as a pagan, Virgil cannot enter heaven. When the two poets reach the earthly paradise at the summit of the mountain of purification, Virgil vanishes from Dante's side, and his role as guide is taken by the glorified Beatrice. This moment, when it happens, is one of the most poignant in the whole of the comedy, but it is inevitable. Human goodness, human reason, are the source and the guide of noble thoughts, noble deeds, noble visions, but they cannot encompass the height or the depths of human experience. The joy of heaven is something far beyond Virgil's most radiant imaginings. Equally, on the journey through hell, he finds himself baffled and distressed on more than one occasion by the evidence of human wickedness which he and Dante encounter. In the same way, liberal humanism has extreme difficulty in coping with the sheer evil involved in the activity of a Harold Shipman or a Donato Bilancia, with the horror of innocent suffering uh, at Bologna Centrale 40 years ago or Sandy Hook in 2012. On the international scene, it's clear how uneasy and uncertain the European leaders of the 1930s were in their dealings with the Nazi regime in Germany or with Mussolini and his followers here in Italy. And there have been enough examples of ruthless exploitation, political oppression and, eth and ethnic cleansing in more recent years to remind us that Hitler and company do not have a monopoly on the 20th century's human wickedness. In more recent times, the leaders of the nations have not fared that much better than their predecessors in dealing with a Slobodan Milosevic or a Bashar al-Assad. The love of God, on the other hand, and the grace of God not only confront and judge such evil, they can overcome its worst effects. In the 1980s and 1990s, there were some unexpected voices coming out of the troubles of Northern Ireland and out of the South African struggle against apartheid, the witness of a Gordon Wilson, a Colin Parry, or a Desmond Tutu, remind us that however low we may fall, God's arms are outstretched below us to support us, and however high we may raise the peaks of human imagination and achievement, God's self is always immeasurably higher. Virgil cannot save Dante when he is threatened by the furies of the gates of the city of Dis, 
He cannot lead Dante all the way to look on God. Only one who lives consciously in God's presence, an angel, a Beatrice, a Bernard of Clairvaux, can do that. And they can do that only in so far as they are agents of God's grace, embodying the love which bears and overcomes the greatest evil imaginable, the forgiveness which speaks to us even from the agony of the cross. Dante's journey to the knowledge of that love and forgiveness takes him through Good Friday and Easter Eve. It takes him into not the cold silence of the tomb, but the frozen malevolence at the heart of hell. There we find, reflected in Dante, the Christian conviction of sin, that knowledge of the darkest depths of self, far removed from the warmth of God's love. There he finds the corruption of human society, a society twisted away from the fellowship, the communion, which is God's intention for his people. It's those sins against the integrity of God's people that Dante asks us to take most seriously. The sins of the senses, those failures of self-control which we tend to think of when we hear the word sin, lust, gluttony and the like, those sins Dante relegates to the fringes, the outer suburbs of hell, the central and deepest places in the pit are reserved for those whose malice makes impossible any sort of life in community. And if you think that sounds shockingly contemporary, I wouldn't argue with you. In the lowest depths, cut off from those above by a great cliff of sheer rock, we find those who corrupt the specifically human power to communicate rationally those who corrupt language by their lies and their flattery, those who buy and sell people as though they were a commodity, those who pervert justice for their own gain, those who destroy trust between individuals and communities, and at the very bottom of the pit, trapped in the frozen lake which imprisons Satan, those who betray the most basic human loyalties to family, to nation, to guests, and to their lords. Here, late at night on Holy Saturday, Dante and Virgil discover the lowest depths of corruption to which human beings can sink. From this point, it is possible only to go upwards. So for us, unless we sink into the same frozen despair as the damned, our recognition of the depths of which we are capable is the prelude to our rising with Christ, to seek, in St Paul's words, the things that are above. So, on Easter morning, Dante and Virgil emerge at last from the stink and noise and filth of hell into the light and fresh air, as they join the company of those on their way to salvation. These are the people who know themselves to be sinners, but unlike the damned who have cut themselves off from God's grace, they are open in penitence to the work of God's Holy Spirit purifying them. Those in hell have chosen to cut themselves off from God. Those on the mountain have their hearts, in spite of all their failings, set on God. They have chosen life. They follow the sun, that powerful image of light and warmth, of, of the light and warmth of God's truth and love. They follow the sun around the mountain and slowly but surely they ascend to the place which God had prepared at the beginning for humankind. All through the climb, the men and women on their way to salvation have their hearts turned more and more fully towards God and in him to all God's, towards all God's creatures. The proud, whose love is turned inward on themselves. The envious, whose love is twisted into seeking others' harm. The angry, whose love creates a blinding fog of impatience and frustration. 
the slothful whose love is simply inadequate, and those whose love for created things, food, possessions, other human beings, all of which are good in themselves, get in the way of their love for God, the creator of those good things. All of these are still on the way to salvation. In spite of their failures, the basic orientation of their heart remains toward God. And as they climb the mountain, all that keeps them from God is being cleaned away like a rusty pan under a scouring pad. They know that when all is cleaned away, they will enter the garden at the top of the mountain, the earthly paradise, the place from which all human beings would have set out on their journey had it not been for the primal disobedience of Adam and Eve. This is as far as Virgil can go. Here, Dante will begin a journey which takes him far beyond the realms of natural reason and natural goodness. He enters the kingdom which is opened for us by faith in the risen Christ, that faith which Virgil lacked. Dante's entry into this realm of grace is described in terms which remind us very strongly of baptism. He's brought face to face by Beatrice with his own unworthiness, with his repeated failure. In the depths of his humiliation and shame, he is plunged into the waters of the river Lethe to be restored to his beloved Beatrice on the other bank. From this point of recognition, forgiveness and restoration, Dante can rise, guided by Beatrice now, guided by the divine love of which she is for Dante a human reflection. The experience of restoration, of life after the death to self, is followed by Dante's ascension. He rises with Beatrice into a realm beyond time and space where, like the end of C.S. Lewis's book, The Last Battle, their journey takes them all the time, higher up and farther in, farther into the mystery of God's love. And each successive stage of their journey is more brightly lit by that love. As Dante rises higher, he grows in understanding. This clearer vision illuminates his own life and calling. It illuminates the ethical principles by which the universe is governed, principles which are applied in the poem quite forcefully to the politics and personalities of Dante's own day. As Dante rises, he grows in understanding of God's providence in understanding of grace and salvation, until finally he sees all things as they really are, illumined by the light and truth which are in God. Then, at the prayer of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, Dante finally beholds God. Now, at last, he sees the unity of all creation and all times, he sees the mystery of the Trinity, and he sees Christ, one with the eternal being of the Godhead. That light supreme, within its fathomless, clear substance, showed to me three spheres, which bear three hues distinct, and occupied one space. The first mirrored the rest, the next as though it were rainbow from rainbow, and the third seemed flame breathed equally from each of the first pair. How weak are words, and how unfit to frame my concept, which lags after what was shown so far, t'would flatter it to call it lame. Eternal light, that in thyself alone dwelling, alone dost know thyself, and smile on thy self-love so knowing and so known. The sphering thus begot, perceptible in thee like mirrored light, now to my view, when I had looked on it a little while, seemed in itself and in its own self hue limbed with our image, for which cause mine eyes were altogether drawn and held thereto. As the geometer his mind applies to square the circle, nor for all his wit finds the right formula, howe'er he tries, so strove I with that wonder, 
how to fit the image to the sphere, so sought to see how it maintained the point of rest in it. Thither my own wings could not carry me, but that a flash my understanding clove whence its desire came to it suddenly. High fantasy lost power and here broke off. Yet, as a wheel moves smoothly, free from jars, my will and my desire were turned by love, the love that moves the song and the other stars. <laughs>